and I'm going to, we are going to go live. All right. And here we go. Good morning. Uh, we're going to wait just another moment while people are coming aboard. Thank you for joining us this morning. We'll be starting in just a moment. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, good morning. My name is Barbara Griswold. I'd like to welcome you to the first General Topics Fab Friday presentation of this winter term. We're part of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, known as OLLI, at UNC Asheville. I'm co-chair of a committee that arranges these events, which are open to OLLI members and non-members alike. There will be five more virtual presentations this month and next as part of the winter term. And you can find details about these in the OLLI Observer newsletters if you get those, or by just typing OLLI, O-L-L-I, OLLI Asheville into a search engine. Then you would look at the events page. Next week on January 22nd, we will have a talk about avoiding hip fractures. And the following week, January 29th, um, we will have Brian Tompkins from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He's going to talk about the crucial role of pollinators, including some new research and new approaches to helping them. And now for today, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Carolyn Ward, CEO of the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation. The foundation is a close nonprofit ally of the National Park Service, enabling numerous projects such as the operation of the Blue Ridge Music Center in Virginia, the ongoing renovations at the Moses Cone House, and clearing out overgrown scenic overlooks. Carolyn is an author, a former professor, and an award-winning researcher. She was recognized by the Obama White House as a champion of change. For her collaborations with the National Park Service, various state parks, and other organizations. She'll make her presentation and then we'll follow that with a time for question and answer. Um, if you will use the Q&A button on your screen to uh, type in your questions, Carolyn will um, address those at the end, but please go ahead and enter them um, as they occur to you. And so now I will happily turn it over to Carolyn Ward. Thank you so much, Barbara. It is so fabulous to be with this group again. I had the pleasure of joining you in person uh, several years ago to talk about some of the work at the foundation. And I'm so happy to be back. I'm sad that we're not in person, uh, but it is delightful to be able to chat with you all again. 
Um, as Barbara said, my name is Carolyn Ward, and I thought I'd start a little bit by telling you some about myself and why I do what I do. Um, like many of you, I grew up out in the woods. I grew up uh, hiking with my dad that you see pictured here, um, exploring the Blue Ridge Mountains and just generally falling in love with nature. And I became a professor, went to Virginia Tech to get a degree in forestry and moved out to Northern California to teach at a university. And I loved what I did. And I did lots of research uh, examining human wildlife interactions how to control visitor behavior when they're out in our parks and public lands and getting them to do the right thing, even when it might not be their first inclination. And I had a daughter uh, that you see in the picture here, Virginia. And when she was about three years old, we had a birthday party for her and we had some little activities planned. And one of which was to go walk through the grass and sat down and put our feet in the creek. And I had a couple little things we were going to do. And so I looked at all the kids and I was like, Hey, let's go, you know, walk down and take our shoes off and put them in the, in the creek and sit on the grass. And the kids looked up their parents and the parents looked back at the kids and the parents were like, it's okay, honey, you don't have to take your shoes off. And the parents ran back off to their cars to get blankets that the kids could sit on so they didn't have to sit in the grass. And after that was over, I uh, was a little disheartened and pretty shocked, uh, actually, and scared about what I saw and started doing some research and reading and learning that kids were plugged into electronic devices for about eight hours a day. They spent three to four minutes outside. Uh, in unstructured play, and they were generally becoming very disconnected with nature. And I got very concerned about what the future would then hold for our parks and public lands if we didn't have a next generation of stewards. And so I left a pretty cush job. Uh, I was school professor and told my husband, I, we've got to go back and see if we can make a difference. And I found a position that was listed at the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation uh, based here in Asheville to start a program called Kids in Parks. And I said, you know, I've got to put my money where my mouth is. I tell my students every day they can go change the world if they see a problem. And I saw a problem and I realized I needed to try to help make a difference. And that brought me back here to Asheville to start Kids in Parks. Um, and my daughter uh, got to come back and fish with her grandfather and get reconnected with nature. And so I am delighted to be here. I'm delighted to talk about the work of the foundation and what we do to help protect our park, my favorite park, the one that happens to go across the mountains that I call home. So I'm gonna kill my video now so that you can see the images better. And we'll talk a little bit about the work of the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation and what we do to try to help make a difference. So as I'm sure you all know, the Blue Ridge Parkway is more than just a road. It is an economic engine. It is the number one driver of tourism in this part of the world. Uh, it brings and returns $10 for every $1 that's invested. It's number one in job creation for every national park unit in the entire country. The parkway generates more jobs, about 15,000 jobs. It brings about $1.1 billion to local communities. And in 2019, we haven't got the official numbers for 2020 yet. So in 2019, it brought more than 15 million visitors to our local mountain towns. And as y'all know, you can't often find food and lodging and, and lots of things like that along the parkway. So you have to get off the parkway and go into the local communities, which is why it's such an economic engine. The Blue Ridge Parkway, as gorgeous as it is, is more than just an economic engine. It connects two states. It unifies a lot of these little mountain towns together. It's got 4,000 neighbors. It's not a big bubble park like most of our parks are in the country. It's a long linear park. We talk about it being like a string of pearls connecting these various uh, bigger bubbles along the way. And in some places, the parkway is only a few feet a few yards on each side before it hits other public land or private land. In addition to being an economic engine for our local mountain towns, it's a haven for biodiversity. 
the Blue Ridge Parkway is one of the most biodiverse places in all of the temperate world. And it's because you've got a lot of northern species that have their southern range and southern species that are in their most northern range. And there's plants and animals found here that are endemic, only found here, nowhere else in the world, which makes it a really rich place to come and experience nature. In addition to being an economic engine and a haven for biodiversity, it's also a living museum for culture and history. There are so many stories that are captured along the Blue Ridge Parkway. And you often think of things like the little mountain shack, the little pioneer cabin, but it also has places like this, the Moses H. Cohn Memorial Park. This is Flat Top Manor. And it was a German Jewish immigrant, the Denim King that lived here and built this house uh, right outside of Blowing Rock. So you have this economic engine, you have all of this diversity, you have these stories that are captured here and, and this long linear park that's stretched out and all of those things combine to also make it very challenging to manage. Because it's this long linear park and because most of the people that come to the parkway, about 90% of them come for the views come to see those sweeping vistas that guess what? The parkway doesn't own. It's owned by private individuals. It's owned by other federal agencies or state parks. And it requires a lot of work to bring all of those partners together to ensure that we're protecting this parkway. Well, you've got all those challenges combined with the fact that for about the last 20 years, the Blue Ridge Parkway and all national parks for that matter have had flat budgets so the budgets haven't decreased, they've re remained fairly consistent, but in 20 years, the cost of operation goes up. The cost of a can of paint, a gallon of gas, uh, all of those costs dramatically increase. And when your budgets remain the same, over time, that means that you've got this consistent increasing backlog maintenance need. And right now the Blue Ridge Parkway, which we don't wanna be number one in, is one of the top parks that have the most backlog needs that cannot get done. In fact, there's about 30% of the positions on the parkway are vacant and cannot be filled because they don't have the budget to fill them. And that results in more and more work getting sort of pushed to the side, which means that resources degrade even further. So that's why the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation was started. We're uh, uh, coming up on a 25th anniversary in the next couple years. We were created to try to help bridge that gap in funding between what the Park Service gets from the federal government, which is about $16 million. It's about less than a dollar per visitor, if you think about it. And the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is, to, is trying to help bridge that gap between what they get and what they actually need. We do that in lots of ways, and that's what I'll talk a little bit about now. And since our inception, we've provided about $16 million in direct support for projects and programs along the parkway. When we think about the work of the foundation, I, I think about it in four sort of chunks of things that we do. And the reason we do it that way is because a lot of our donors and supporters care about very specific things and because the parkway itself manages these things in those sorts of categories. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about those. So one of the things that we do is we help fund projects and programs that protect the cultural and historic resources found along the parkway. Those iconic things that often bring a lot of the visitors. Mabry Mill is a perfect example, which you can see here. This is a project that we did several years ago. The mill wheel had stopped turning which meant that the grist mill inside of the mill could not grind corn and flat, make flour anymore or cornmeal. So it was hurting the education and interpretation programming. And we invested in fixing the mill wheel and fixing the flume that brought the water to the mill. One of the other large projects that we're currently working on that Barbara referenced earlier was the work at Moses H. Cone Memorial Park to restore Flat Top Manor. This is a house that's over 100 years old. It was built in the early 1900s. It is an enormously beautiful facility, but when you get a little closer, from a distance it looks great, but when you get a little closer, you begin to see the wear and tear that has happened. You have a wooden structure on top of a mountain 
in the mountains in Blowing Rock, it's going to receive a lot of wear and tear, and it's really starting to show its age. And again, that sort of decrease in funding, real funding, has resulted in some of this. And you know what? You can't run down to Lowe's Hardware or Home Depot and pick up a board. These things were individually made for this house. And so to do the work is historic restoration. You have to protect as much of the historic fabric as you can when you do projects like this. So we've invested by leveraging our donors. We've brought in additional support. This is going to be about a $3 million project. It started at the end of December. There were pillars on the manor house that were actually falling apart. And so the structure itself was becoming uh, imperiled. So this project's going to go in, take all the pillars off. They're taking all the railings down. They're taking all of the windows out of the manor house. They're shipping them down to Greensboro to a historic preservation workshop where they'll be fully restored and then brought back and installed again in spring. So this is what it currently looks like. All the windows are boarded up to keep the interior of the house safe and protected while all of these components are at a historic shop being restored. They'll come back in a, about early spring and then they'll begin the restoration on the rest of the house. They're gonna replace the roof. They're going to, you can see a lot of the boards that have some damage and then it will get fully repainted. So we're really excited about this project. We've been raising money for this project for about 10 years. There's a lot of support for bringing this manor back to its full glory. Another one of the projects that we do that helps preserve history and culture, and this was done last year, was an MP gallery project. So there are thousands of images, historic photographs, maps, and documents that the Park Service has in their historic archives, which is fabulous. We're preserving these things, but the public didn't have access to them. So we worked with the Park Service to bring an intern on board last year to digitize these images and put them in a place that the public had access to. So now you can actually go and look at over 8,000 images, maps, documents, there's all kinds of fabulous information in this resource. And the link is called mpgallery.mps.gov. And you can actually find historic images for all national parks on that site. And then if you want to look for one specific to the parkway, you put the slash BLRI, which is Blue Ridge Parkway. And we actually had one of our donors that was going through uh, the MP gallery and he found this image and he said, my grandfather worked for the National Park Service on the parkway until his retirement. The gallery not only led me to photographs that could potentially show my grandfather, but the search feature let me find two photos that were actually tagged with his name, along with the date and location. So I'm sure that you all will go and have a lot of fun running through the MP gallery. And I can't thank you all enough for the support that folks have given us to help make projects like this possible. It's a really fabulous resource. Another one of the projects that we are super excited about that we did last year is work to renovate the Bluffs restaurant. Of all of the resources found along the parkway, the number one phone call that I get since I have been here is when are you gonna get the Bluffs restaurant open? There have been people that called me crying saying, I wanna take my mom there, please. You know, she's getting a little older and this is where we spent all our childhood every summer and please reopen the restaurant. So despite the pandemic, and despite lots of projects on the parkway getting stopped, we were able to complete this restoration last year. The Bluffs restaurant was the first restaurant that opened on the entire parkway. It opened in the 40s. So it's the first visitor service that started and you can see it here back. Uh, this was right after it opened. And Ellen was the wait one of the waitresses that worked there. She worked there from the day that it opened until the day, unfortunately, that it closed in 2010, the facility shuttered. And when you shut an old building up, bad things tend to happen. So mold came in, it got completely uh, overrun with mold. There had to be mold remediation done before any construction could actually take place. 
So we decided we would take this project on. We received uh, generous support and funding from the Appalachian Regional Commission and also from the state of North Carolina, coupled with hundreds of our donors that, that supported this project. We raised almost a million dollars and restoration work could begin. So once the mold was removed, we went in and we had to be very careful again. This is a historic structure. So for example, you can see those, those lights hanging. They have a red top and a white bottom. Those were historic and we had to send them to a place. I think we found a place in Richmond that could do the restoration work on those. Uh, again, can't just run down and buy new lights. So it was a very painstaking process. We were also able to keep people employed during the pandemic. When a lot of work stopped, we did a safe process of getting folks in there to do this renovation restoration work, rebuilt the uh, countertop, repainted the interior, um, did a lot, put all new kitchen equipment, all new electric, and this is what Bluff looks like today. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we were only open for a very short time in uh, last year, but we do plan to open in spring of 2021. And we very much look forward uh, to having folks back in there to share a wonderful meal. If you do wanna go take a look at what Bluff looks like today, we have installed a webcam that's up on the roof and it moves around so you can actually see the current conditions up on the mountain. We hope to be able to do these in other locations along the parkway so that when you can't travel there, maybe you can virtually take a peek. And you can find those at brpfoundation.org slash webcams. And so you can uh, go to that site and pull up the webcam that's on the roof of the bus restaurant. In addition to trying to preserve history and culture, and making sure those resources are protected. We also fund projects that enhance visitor experiences. That's what it's about. In addition to protecting the place, we wanna give people access to it and be able to experience it. This is one of the earlier projects we funded up at Rough Ridge to build the boardwalk, to not just protect the fragile plants found under the boardwalk, but to make the visitor experience safe. We do trail work. This is work we did up at Craggy Gardens. There was a lot of erosion that was taking place. There's a lot of use up there. So we worked with the park service to fund a crew that went in to do uh, work to get that trail hardened and protected to make the visitor experience safer and to protect the resources found around it. As Barbara mentioned, another of the projects that I love is the restoration work we do for the overlooks. You know, the Blue Ridge Parkway was a designed landscape. Stanley Abbott walked those hills. They thought about what you would see around every curve as you drove the parkway. And what you were to see was not like a green tunnel. It was beautiful vistas and overlooks. And those were designed. They went in and they removed trees. They put certain uh, trees in so that when you came around the corner, you had this beautiful oak and maybe there were some uh, uh, rhododendrons around the bottom of it and over time those overlooks have become overgrown. So we've been working uh, as part of our Trails and Views Forever program to get some of those overlooks open back up again. We fund the uh, Arborist Incident Response Team. They bring experts from across the country working with uh, Dr. Chris Olry who's the plant botanist for the parkway and they go in a couple times a year. They have to be careful that they do it and the birds aren't nesting um, and protect, make sure they're protecting the resources. And they go in in spring and fall and uh, open back up the overlooks. So here's a couple that are south of Asheville. So this was before the overlook clearing. And here you can see it afterwards. And there's one more south of Asheville. And you can see the three trees to the left, and here is that same overlook after it was cleared. And so often we'll get questions about, oh my gosh, you're cutting down trees in a park. N normally you wouldn't do something like that, but this was a designed landscape and they're bringing it back to the original design. And so projects like this are actually protecting the landscape found along the Blue Ridge Parkway. Another one of the projects that we do that helps make visitor experiences better, and in this case, safer, 
was an, an example of a partnership project. We, we partner with lots of folks, not just the National Park Service, but it, like I said earlier, a lot of the land adjacent to the park service is owned by other folks. So, for example, when you go to Graveyard Fields and you park in the parking lot and you walk down that trail, now you're in Pisgah National Forest. And so if the trail's in bad shape or there are issues there, it impacts your experience. So for this project, we partnered with the Pisgah Conservancy, the Appalachian Wilderness Stewards, the U.S. Forest Service, and the Haywood County Emergency Services. This is in Pisgah District, a little bit south of Graveyard. This is the number one place that they have search and rescues for all of Haywood County Emergency Services. And it's because a lot of folks come up there, they think, oh, I'm gonna go for a little hike and they get lost, they're not prepared. So we worked with our design team with Kids in Parks to come up with a cutting edge design for signs. The yellow that you see is actually the outline of the sign. So it's shaped like a bear head or a bear to grab attention, get you to read it, to see if we could reduce the number of search and rescues in this area. So my background, uh, as I think Barbara mentioned, was in doing a lot of research, and we wanted to see if we could create an interpretive sign that would indeed affect visitor behavior. So we collected two years of data prior to installing 22 signs in key access points in this part of uh, the parkway. And then we had one year of data after the signs were installed, and we actually had a 50% reduction in search and rescues because of the interpretive signage. So it shows the power of partnerships and the power of good education and interpretive sign design. So this was one project that I was really excited about doing. Another aspect of visitor experiences is making sure you have access. And so we worked a few years ago to fund a project. This is at Abbott Lake. Up, um, it's the northern end of the parkway right outside of Roanoke. This is Peaks of Otter. And we funded the only fully ADA accessible trail. This is a paved trail that goes around the whole lake to make sure that all visitors can have access and have a safe experience. Another category we fund is protecting natural resources. So you can protect the history and culture, you can make sure visitors are safe when they're out there, but you've also got to protect the resources that they're there to experience, the natural resources. So these are projects that we have worked with the Park Service for years on. This is one of my favorite ones. We fund uh, wildlife cameras. We put them up in places along the whole parkway. They take pictures of anything that trips them. And this will allow the Park Service experts and park uh, biologists to understand the movements and behavior of the animals, what animals are there, how visitor interaction can be impactive, and just generally protect these resources better. Another project that we funded uh, with the park is to try to help save the hemlock trees. The uh, hemlock woolly adelgid has been decimating the hemlock forest in these mountains. I think I heard 90% of the trees are infected. A good percentage of those, if we don't treat them, are gonna die. Uh, you can see the ghost trees anytime you drive in this part of the world. So we worked with the Park Service to fund a project to treat the remaining trees that are not beyond uh, saving to try to help bring this species back. This is gonna devastate our mountains. Uh, you know, when the chestnut trees got wiped out in the early 1900s, there were trees, the oaks, that could come and fill that ecological niche that the chestnuts were in. But for the hemlocks, there is not a tree that can come in and fill that niche. <clears throat> they grow and protect the watersheds. They keep the temperature of the streams low. And there's not another evergreen that can come in and fill that niche. And so it's really critical that we try to save the ones that we can. Another project to help protect natural resources was one we did a few years ago. These are uh, bog turtles. These little guys are worth a lot of money on the black market, which is super unfortunate. So we funded a project to <clears throat> put trackers on them so that the Park Service could learn where they were, where they migrated, to help protect the corridors that these turtles uh, existed in. And another project that I love uh, is to protect thre threatened and rare species, which you see two of them here. This is GM radium or spreading Ivans on the left, and on the right is Liatris helleri or Heller's blazing star. 
both of these plants are threatened and rare. The uh, yellow one is only found in this part of the world of any place in the entire world. And it grows in rocky outcroppings. It's very susceptible to trampling and to climate change. So there's been research that the park staff has done for years uh, looking at these plants, studying them, seeing the impacts to them, and trying to make sure that we're protecting them. This is a project that involves volunteers, but it's also protecting the natural resources. You know, once they're there, <clears throat> you still have to go back often and take care of them. And these are PG hydrangeas that are found around Bass Lake on the Moses H. Cone Memorial Park. And these were planted by Moses and Bertha Cone over a hundred years ago. So they are a, a plant that, you know, hydrangeas don't typically get this old. We have to go in and take good care of them, make sure we're pruning them and fertilizing and mulching at the appropriate times. So even projects that we have volunteers work on that aren't thousands and thousands of dollars still make a tremendous impact on the parkway. And the fourth area of projects that we fund is education and outreach. So we can protect the resources, both cultural and natural, and we can make them safe and accessible, but we've got to reach that next generation of stewards. We've got to make sure that we're telling the story of the resources on the parkway to help people appreciate them more and then hopefully protect them. So we've done bio blitzes, lots of research studies that we use to create information to tell the public about the things that are found in these mountains that you often don't see. We help create interpretive signage and fun signage uh, and uh, projects like the park maps and the uh, newsletters that they put out. We help fund a lot of that work to try to help tell the story. This is a sign that we did that's um, up at Graveyard Fields. So in addition to funding projects and programs along the Blue Ridge Parkway, we also run a couple programs. And I'll briefly go over a couple of these. We run the Blue Ridge Music Center, and we also run the Kids in Parks program, which is what originally brought me here. So the Blue Ridge Music Center is located at milepost 213. It's essentially on the border of North Carolina and Virginia. So it's about midpoint on the parkway. It is a beautiful outdoor amphitheater. And the National Council for Traditional Arts used to run the concert programming there, but then they thought having a local partner, um, they got it started, helped get it off to a great start, and then having a local partner they thought was perhaps a better choice. So we agreed to step in in 2013 and take over the operation of the concert programming. And this is, you know, it does a lot of things. It's education and outreach. It's connecting people with history connecting them with the culture of the mountain music that was so prevalent in this area and taking that traditional culture and bringing it into the next generation. So unfortunately last year, right, we didn't get to have bands like Steep Canyon Rangers and we weren't all up in front of the stage dancing like we had been in the past. And we certainly didn't have concerts like this that we had for the Old Crow Medicine Show. But we were able to expand education and outreach by funding a partner ranger that was available to answer questions and provide information and education for visitors. And we were able to hold five concerts. At the end of the season in fall, we did feel like because it's an outdoor amphitheater that seats like 6,000 people really, we dramatically reduced capacity and we held five concerts. It was socially distanced. Um, we felt like because it was outside and because we had protocols and procedures in place that we could do it and we were able to and people were extraordinarily grateful. We had a couple folks that attended one of the shows. They actually won tickets from a WFDD and Kendra Speech wrote, I didn't realize how much I missed being out in the open air. My niece Zamara and I enjoyed the music of Amethyst Kia and Shay Martin Lovett. The staff and volunteers of the foundation did a great job organizing socially distanced. The food was delicious and there was a wonderful, peaceful environment created. It was a great day and we both left the music center feeling rejuvenated. I think all of us can relate to uh, missing some semblance of normalcy and we were certainly happy to be able to do that. The other program that we run is called Kids in Parks. 
And I came here to start that program to help get that next generation of stewards to care about the park I loved. But we quickly realized that this program could go anywhere. And we're so transient now. We don't really are born and raised and live and die in the same place like we used to generations ago. People move around. Uh, they, they take jobs and go to different places. And so we realized that to really get the next generation of stewards for parks, I, I didn't care where they lived. We need to reach all the kids and reconnect them with nature. So the program began to expand. It started as a hiking program, but we quickly learned that not every kid likes to hike. So we now have paddling trails and disc golf trails and biking trails. We even have pediatrician trails. We have over 600 doctors that have this little miniature trailhead sign in their lobby. And you can take that brochure and go in your own backyard and experience nature. You register your experiences on our website and we send the kids prizes. So incentives to go back on another adventure. We have about 600 doctors that are writing prescriptions for kids to go out into nature. And we have about 216 of these trails across the country. We've had over 1 million adventures. This is just a glimpse at some of the trails in the state of North Carolina alone. We have track trails in state parks, county city parks. We have one on the Cherokee Indian Reservation. And a lot of them, of course, along the corridor of the Blue Ridge Parkway. But in 2020, most of these trails were brochure led. You pick up a brochure at the trailhead and, and go on an adventure. And because of COVID, we became very concerned about that contamination of touching paper brochures and maybe you put it back in the brochure rack. So we launched uh, e-adventures. So you can go uh, download these adventures from our website and go on an adventure anywhere, register those, receive prizes and become part of our Kids in Parks program that had the goal of you know, getting this next generation of stewards and helping to protect our parks and public lands. We create lots of educational materials. We work with schools. We actually have STEM uh, citizen science trails located, for example, at Haw Creek Elementary School, where kids can go out and do experiments and learn much more deeply about the, part, the resources around them. So in terms of outcomes from this program, about 50, we've had over about 1 million adventures. Last year alone, we had 20, about 24,000 uh, adventures registered on our trails. We've got 53% of the kids that register their adventures were first time visitors to the park they went to, which means we are bringing new folks into parks. About 47% come back for a second adventure. And of those, about 80% go to a different location. So this idea of networking all these public lands together on one website where you can go, maybe you start out at your county park and then you go to your state park and then maybe you come into the national park. Um, that series of experiences, it's like a gateway drug. We're giving them gateway nature experiences to try to help bring more and more folks into our parks and public lands. And we're able to do all of this quite frankly, because of you, because of the community of stewards that care about our park. So whether you have the Blue Ridge Parkway license plate, or you volunteer, or you're a donor, or you come to one of our events, it's all of us working together that are truly making a difference. The Blue Ridge Parkway license plate is one of the easiest ways to help support the work of the foundation. We, it's the number one plate in the state of North Carolina. If you purchase one of these, it costs $30 more than a normal plate, but $20 comes directly back to us to do these projects and programs, and $10 goes to the highway beautification. It plants those gorgeous flowers along the roadsides in North Carolina, and it makes sure that it keeps all of our uh, restroom facilities along the state uh, ADA accessible, so it's a great program. We get about a half a million dollars a year because of this program. We have lots of folks that volunteer, that come out and give their time. We have folks that come into our offices and help us do paperwork, uh, administrative assistant, going out into the park and doing hands-on work. So there's lots of ways of becoming engaged. 
Now, normally we do lots of events. We bring people together. We have meet and greets. We go out and experience the parkway. We have a denim ball that we do every year uh, right out, right in Blow and Rock to raise money for Cone. But last year was a little different. Um, but we were able to have one event last year. It was our first uh, master fly fishing tournament, and we hope to do this again. You know, you don't want to fish next to somebody in a creek, so it was a perfect way to do an event in the age of COVID when you've got to stay away from each other. And here you can see Jan, who got second place with a 26-inch trout. This was done right outside of Blowing Rock and Boone. It was a really great event, fun time out on the river. Even though it rained the whole day, uh, you can look, see from the look on her face, she was having a pretty good time. <laughs> Uh, one of the other ways that has been really helpful for us that we launched last year was our Trails and Views Forever program. This is our uh, attempt to raise $3 million. Last year, we raised a million thanks to a generous match offer from an anonymous donor. We raised a million dollars, which is one third of our total goal. And that money is going to be used over about the next 10 years to give a consistent source of funding for the park to do work on trails, overlooks, campgrounds, picnic areas, education and outreach, to try to help bring some of these things back to their full glory. Because unfortunately, a lot of the resources in the park look like this now. When you have a picnic table that's you know approaching uh, 70 years old, it tends to start to show some wear. So we wanna bring these things back to the way that they should be so that my, my children and your children and our grandchildren can experience it. So if you join the Trails and Views Forever program, if you're a founding funder, which is a donor of $1,000 or more, you get a patch and your name goes on one of the donor boards that's located throughout the parkway, uh, showing the folks that have helped save some of the resources in the park. So thank any of you that are part of this program. Thanks for all your support for helping make this possible. We also write a lot of grants. Uh, we did that for the Hemlock uh, Willie Adelgid program that we did. So we're always looking for foundations and folks that we might be able to appeal to to help us make work this make this work possible. The Parkway Protectors is a program that we're expanding. We started last year, and these are our monthly donors and folks that commit to a monthly donation receive the I Heart the Parkway sticker. So thank any of you that are part of that program. And mostly we're able to do this work because we form partnerships and friendships. It takes all of us. This, this park is, it's our home, right? I look out and see the parkway from my house and I feel an obligation to take care of it for my daughter and her kids. Um, building this community of stewards is really what will make a difference. And so as I started the program, uh, talking about my daughter, uh, here you can see her. She is now volunteering with the Park Service. This is her rappelling off one of the cliffs um, to do the research on those rare plants, working with Dr. Chris Ulrey. And so I have not regretted one minute the decision to come back here and try to help make a difference because it has certainly made sure that she will walk barefoot uh, through the grass and she'll put her feet in a creek, which means a lot to me and all of the kids that we've been able to reach to help make that difference. And so I'm going to turn my video back on and see if anybody has any questions. And I've got a couple here. Um, somebody uh, asked about the overlook signs that have been defaced or removed. And there have been a lot. I receive uh, emails and, and information all the time about you know, trail damage, sign damage. The Park Service goes about this several different ways. Sometimes we, they can use volunteers to go in and help clean up. Um, if they get graffitied, which unfortunately happens, sometimes you can just go in with particular kinds of cleaner and, and get their paint or whatever they've done off. Sometimes they have to be removed and taken back to the sign shop and fixed. Unfortunately, as I said earlier, because of you know 30% of their staff positions being vacant, 
because of the lack of funding, sometimes they sit in the sign shop and don't get fixed right away. And so that, again, just shows the dramatic need uh, that's out there for our park. Um, I had a question that was sent to us earlier about the Great American Outdoors Act. So uh, many of you may be familiar with the Great American Outdoors Act. It got passed last year. It's the largest, going to be the largest influx of funding support for deferred maintenance for national parks in 50 years. So it'll be the largest chunk of money that's going to come in to try to help make a difference. And I had somebody ask me, you know, is that is that what y'all do? Is this going to fix everything you've been trying to fix? And I guess the real answer is unfortunately no. I'd love to be out of a job and not need a foundation to help make a difference. Most of the money probably for the Great American Outdoors Act for our park is going to go for protecting the road, the road itself. So it costs about a million dollars to pave one mile. Parkway is 469 miles long. Uh, the park's not going to get that much money. They'll get some of the big pot that's coming, but it's going to have to get distributed across 416 national park units. So I think that our work will still always be needed. And I am so delighted about the Great American Outdoors Act because I think it will make a difference um, in fixing some of the road, which quite frankly, our donors just are not likely to be able to want to support paving the road. Um, and so we are super excited about those projects, which probably will start in 22. Um, realistically, there may be some that can start late in 21. Carolyn, I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know on your website for the foundation, um, you do have some videos from time to time uh, from webinars that you've done. Um, can you tell us what kind of things are there that we can learn more about things? Thank you, Barbara. That's a great question. Um, we do have a series of webinars we've been doing. Um, we, we actually started them because of COVID and we couldn't have events where we got to talk to people. And I think we'll keep doing them because they've proven to be pretty useful. Um, a lot of our supporters are across the country and they can't come to our events anyway. So if you go to our website, brpfoundation.org, if you go to the bottom and click on the YouTube link, we have all of our webinars up on our YouTube channel. You can actually subscribe to the YouTube channel. And then when a new one comes out, you'll get it or you'll get notification about it. Um, we have more detailed information, for example, on all the work we did at Bluff, all the work we did at Moses Cone. So you can see like a 30 minute presentation on just those projects. We also have webinars on fly fishing the Blue Ridge Parkway or what the uh, differences are in elevation for the plants and uh, that you see along the parkway. So there's some great resources there. Thank you for that question, Barbara. Okay, thanks. I, I had seen the one about the Moses Cone restoration and the, the scope of that and the detail involved. It really was quite fascinating. Um, we have a couple questions. Somebody asked about, can we talk about trash pickup? So, I, again, I hate saying this, but because of COVID, right, there used to be lots of volunteer groups that would go out and do trash collection and lots of volunteer organizations that do that kind of work. A lot of that did get put on hold. Uh, it was deemed not to be safe, and they had to make sure that they were keeping people safe when they were out there. But there are lots of opportunities to volunteer. You can actually go on the National Park Service website and they have a sign up to become a VIP, a volunteer in park. And you can sign up to become a volunteer. And uh, Caitlin runs that program and she puts out information about volunteer opportunities as they arise. So it's a great way. Um, we also at the foundation have volunteers that do projects with us. There's the Carolina Mountain Club, Friends of the Mountains to Sea Trail. So there's lots of organizations out there that do projects like that along the parkway. And then someone uh, talked about the Super Scenic Highway. Uh, there are several books about the Blue Ridge Parkway. I was looking to see if I had it so I could easily grab it. But there is a book written by Dr. Ann Wisnett called the Super Scenic Highway. It's a fabulous history of the Blue Ridge Parkway. Um, and this individual said they were so inspired 
about reading that book that they contracted Audrey Pearson, who is our uh, Trails and Views project manager and helps run our volunteer program to see about volunteering. So thank you, Phil, so much for that. We can, we can use all the help we can get. Let's see, we have one more question. I've been donating to the National Park Foundation and the Friends of the Smokies. Do you coordinate any programs with them? That is a fabulous question. So we, my philosophy is like the more the better, right? The more partners, the more folks you can bring into something, the better off we all are. Rising tide lifts all boats, right? So we do a lot of work with the National Park Foundation. They have funded and partnered with us on several programs and projects. Uh, work at Maybury Mill is a good example. They partnered with us on that. And then we actually pulled together, you know, the Blue Ridge Parkway when it was created was designed to connect Shenandoah National Park to Great Smoky Mountain National Park. So in my organization, what we did is we reached out to Shenandoah Trust, which is the equivalent of my group for Shenandoah, and the Friends of the Smokies, which is the equivalent for the Smokies. We actually meet once a year together. We talk about ways we can partner, projects we can work on together, uh, we worked with the Friends of the Smokies, for example, to fund a project to help make sure we were protecting the elk because uh, the elk sort of moved back and forth between the southern end of the parkway and the Smokies. So, yes, absolutely. We work with all the partners and groups found along this area. And finally, somebody asked about employment. Uh, is employment closed because of finances? Yes. So right now the park service budget that they receive to operate the park is about 87% taken by salary. So that means they only have about 11, 12% of their entire budget to buy gas, to fix a tire, to paint a building. And if you start thinking about that, that's basically impossible. And so when positions become vacant, when somebody retires, when somebody moves along, Often they can't fill that position because they have to commit that budget to that salary, which now means they can't buy any gas. And so it's a very delicate balance. Um, we are hopeful that the Great American Outdoors Act will have provisions in it to allow them to bring some of this critical staff back because sometimes money isn't the only answer, right? If they don't have the staff that can do the job, giving them more money often can't solve the problem. So we're hoping that the Great American Outdoors Act will allow for replacement of some of the critical staff. Well, if we don't have any more questions, uh, Barbara, or you don't have any more questions for me, I would like to thank everyone so much for all your time. It has indeed been a pleasure. My email's up there, my phone number's there. If anybody thinks of anything later that they'd like to ask about, please, please reach out. Oh, thank you so much, Carolyn. It's, it's just wonderful. Just just the photographs alone that we get to see and hearing about all this is is uh, kind of restorative <laughs> these days. Um, I do want to thank everyone for, for tuning in and also remind you that we are having um, another Fab Friday on the 22nd. That will be um, avoiding hip fractures, again, 1130. And the following week, the 29th, uh, we'll have the Fish and Wildlife Service expert talking about pollinators. Um, look in your Ollie Observer if you get that. And if not, you can Google Ollie Asheville and look at the events page to get the details. And again, thank you to Dr. Carolyn Ward. And I'd like to also thank my committee members, my co-chair, Jane Yokoyama, Bruce Jones, Martha Marshall, and Sue Kibler. Thank you so much for joining us today.